Welcome to another season of Brewing the Facts. I'm your host and home brewer, Anthony Yotso, and this time I'll be brewing a beer that reminds me of the seventh doctor from classic Doctor Who, Sylvester McCoy. This will be a Scottish export style. It will be called Fenric's Revenge, a roasty peaty and malty scotch ale. Last time I did a partial mash outside with a propane tank. This time I'll be doing a partial mash inside my very own kitchen, as you can see, uh, just right here on this stove. And this is to show you the many versatile ways that we can brew beer. And as always, uh, please remember to sanitize everything you'll be using. I've already done this to most of my stuff and I'll be sanitizing as it continues. It's very important to make sure no off flavors come out in your beers. Uh, in this episode, we'll be seeping the grain, but before I get to the grains I'll be using, it's time for us to jump into our time machines uh, that belong in our minds and take a trip back to ancient times and the first humans who enjoyed the first sips of the oldest man-made alcohol. So let's answer the question that plagues our dreams. Why beer? Mesopotamia, you know, Gilgamesh, the voyages of Sinbad, Gozer, the birthplace of beer. We begin by traveling back in time. The Sumerians of Mesopotamia documented beer brewing and drinking in ancient picture texts made on tablets of stone. An archaeological excavation in modern-day Iran known as Godin Tepe shows evidence dating back to 3500 BCE. This means that most will say that brewing probably began back in 4000 BCE. However, ceramics found at a site known as Sumer, which is modern day Iraq and Kuwait, show that beer was a part of the culture many thousands of years back in that region. A date cannot be given, but it is estimated that beer production can possibly be 10,000 years old. Imagine that. Of course, in China, we also know that a beer known as Koi was being brewed thousands of years ago after an excavation unearthed rooms with advanced beer making tools. It's very possible that even before these civilizations started to get into the homebrew experience, the discovery of beer was actually an accident. Barley was one of the main grains in the area now known as Iraq. Many historians have a hypothesis that the barley got wet, most likely from rain as it sat in clay pots. People would eat the barley, and it's believed that they realized as it remained wet over time that it actually tasted better and was easier to chew and digest. Bread was made from this barley, and at some point people crumbled the bread and mixed it with water. They later drank it and realized that it gave them dance fever! No, not that dance fever. Instead, it made them feel good, and they would stumble around probably laughing with their buddies. Perhaps it made it easier to work 16 hours in harsh conditions. Perhaps it even led to babies, one could only speculate. Regardless, people wanted more, and some believe that this began the transition to people settling down, getting into agriculture, and starting societies instead of wandering in nomadic tribes. But while it's cool to think brewing is the reason we came together as a community, I'm sure that the tools to make agriculture easier help too. Though, beer must have been very nice to drink after plowing a field for 16 hours in the hot sun. While the first beers were essentially made from barley or whatever grains were available, to be honest, uh, just by leaving them in clay pots with a little bit of water, uh, usually the water collected by rain, and it allowed natural fermentation with wild yeasts. Uh, and of course, the science and production of beer has come a long way since those present times. Even so, we still understand the importance of grain. In my recipe, I'll be using one pound of Viking roasted barley malt, a pound of flaked corn, otherwise known as maize, a pound of Weyermann's Kara Amber Malt from Germany, a pound of Dingman's Kara 45 Kara Munich Malt from Belgium, 
I will also be using a pound of Viking Caramel 300 malt and a pound of Viking Lightly Peated malt. And these will be combined in my grain bag and seeped uh, in three gallons of water between about 140 and 160 degrees for about 70 minutes. I'll then be doing a little bit of a sparging hack to collect the excess sugars from the grain for this brew. Uh, of course, these steps are my favorite parts of the brewing process because you really begin to smell the grain profile as it seeps. And there isn't much to do but smell, check the temperature, and drink a beer and chill. But instead of having you watch me do that for the full 70 minutes, let's actually take a trip back in time 5,000 years ago to learn more about the history of beer. While many think what we do is very advanced in beer making, most of our basic techniques were developed long ago. And we could go back five millennia to find evidence of civilizations brewing with some sophistication. And this is also suggested in research from an excavation in the China Majea dig site is around the city of Xi'an in northern Shanxi province. Some of the items excavated at the site include a stove, pottery shards from specialized jugs and pots, and an item shaped like a funnel. The belief was that this might have been an ancient brewery. And Jia Zheng Wang and Li Lu went to China and scraped the yellow residue off the vessels to find out. The residue was analyzed and it was confirmed that these were brewing tools, and they are tools brewers might recognize. The stove showed that water, perhaps the wort, was heated and boiled in the process. And it also has evidence that points to mashing and malting techniques based on the residue in the vessels themselves. They also came up with a recipe for this ancient brew and it was published based on the findings. Broomcorn millet, jobs tears, which is a manicious grass, lily, yam, barley, and snake gourd root were all a part of the residue. You would have to find some wild yeast, of course, from this region and realize that whatever yeast you found probably isn't the same strain as what existed that long ago. Still, the thought we could make something close to an ancient beer is pretty intriguing. future perhaps we'll have some computers that will allow you to smell what I am through some sort of artificial intelligence or something like that. Uh, this is already smelling so peaty, so malty, so roasty. Well, anyone watching this certainly likes a good beer, as I do as well. Uh, we also have other jobs that pay our money. You know, even, even craft brewers obviously are doing this to get paid that cash money but can you believe that people used to be paid in just beer yes in ancient egypt workers were paid in beer rations laborers on the nile and giza plateau were given rations throughout the day as compensation i mean come on nothing like washing down uh, all of your pain from the hard work with a nice warm bowl of beer Mmm, tastes so good. Home brewers, we share our craft to our family and friends. In commercial brewing, you can buy and try beers from all over the world. And festivals might even allow us to sample beers we might not always have available in our region. The same could kind of be said for the spread of brewing in the ancient world. Egyptians began brewing around the same time as those in the Middle East. It became established in those societies. For example, in Egypt, papyrus dating back to 1400 BCE, you had people being warned about getting too drunk. Why? Out of fear of repeating forbidden words. 
You know, when you have one too many and you start acting like an expert on terraforming planets and why Captain Kirk probably has 100 alien babies in the Star Trek series. But seriously, it sounds like beer was a staple to keep the people happy and the pharaohs must have been scared of people getting too much confidence to question things. Another oddity of Egyptian times is that offerings were made to gods, and it is said Ramses III gave the gods 400,000 jars of beer. Can you imagine just wasting that much beer? I can't. So my theory is that the pharaoh was secretly having wild parties and didn't want the people to know. Uh, but don't quote me on that one. It's said that the ancient Greeks received their brewing knowledge from the Middle East and Egypt and the Greeks later passed their knowledge to Rome. But with wine being big in those regions, some snobs decided that beer was only for barbarians. They may take our freedom, but they will never tell me wine is better than beer! Ayo! However, Despite most evidence pointing to wine as the drink of choice, there were some interesting findings at Argentico and Agrisa. Both sites were destroyed by fire, and therefore there are some things preserved, including the remains of sprouted cereal grains. In Argentico, the grains date back to 2100 to 2000 BCE. In Agrisa, 3500 sprouted grains were found that date back to 2100 to 1700 BCE. Argentico also had evidence of germinated cereal grains, sprouted grains, and fragments of milled grains. Researchers believe this is evidence of malting and charring. The hypothesis is that beer was used when grapevines were not ripe to make wine, allowing for the consumption of alcohol year-round. Rome, however, was certainly a civilization that was more against beer. They refused to drink it. The Celts and Gauls brewed beer within the Roman Empire, but it was mostly thought of as a barbarian drink. Leave it to the Romans, the one with a leader named Caligula who declared war on the ocean, and the ones who killed their own people because they most likely were sociopathic serial killers that also happened to be rulers. Marcus Aurelius Antonius, known as Elagabalus, threw poisonous snakes into the crowd with lottery tickets because he was bored. Because he was bored! but we do have information on some of the beer that was enjoyed by Roman legionnaires. Cerevisia, which means beer in Celtic. The beer is obviously Celtic in origin, and Romans most likely drank it when conquering that region. Of course, this is one of the reasons why beer was frowned upon later. Once a region was conquered, it was justified to the people by saying the cultures were barbarians. One example of the aversion to beer, Pliny the Elder wrote that beer foam was good for your complexion, but never mentions drinking it. I'm not sure about you, but I am someone who would much rather drink the beer than dip my face in it. Just like last season, I'm using this sparging hack for someone that does a partial mash. Uh, by taking the grain bag, uh, you know, taking some of the grain out of it into this little vessel I've created, slowly pouring water onto it uh, and squeezing out the liquid, uh, to, and then I will add this obviously back into the wort. Uh, I, the reason to do this, I'm maximizing how much sugars that I actually get from this grain that will be used in the wort. Why is that important? Because the yeast will eat this sugar, create CO2 and alcohol, of course, uh, just trying to maximize what I get. While sparging is essential in all grain brewing, uh, it's not really considered essential when working with an extract. Uh, some people may laugh at me for even doing this, but I truly believe it makes a difference. Techniques aside, do you all know that beer is credited with saving the world of humans? Forcing us to stop wandering, creating villages, helping us with medicinal properties, and of course making hard labor a little bit more enjoyable so people would plow the land and build settlements. 
And yes, some of this was about kings taking advantage of poor peasants. Life is terrible, but when you drink beer, am I right? Uh, but uh, it is true that beer did play a large role in why early settlements are formed. As we said before, beer was most likely discovered by accident, and it's believed that it was one of the many reasons why people stopped being nomads. But besides bringing us to agriculture and to create villages and cities, there were some other effects of brewing that might be a surprise to some. One, it led to friendship and trust. Drinking from the same vessel will certainly ease the fear of being poisoned. Beer was also one of the earliest forms of currency. It was so prevalent and important that it began to become intertwined with the religious ceremony and eventually was used to purchase other goods and services. Taxes and tariffs were also paid in beer. That's how important this ended up being. This is why King Hammurabi of Babylon even made a royal decree that no one tamper with beer. If anyone watered down beer, they would be executed. Imagine that. Watered down beer. Executed. Miller Lite would certainly be in trouble in those times. Egypt started to tax beer to fund public works. One of the ways to pay this tax? More beer! What do you win? Another beer. Of course, another interesting use of beer was as medicine. That's right. A chemical analysis of ancient Nubian bones from ancient Egypt show traces of tetracycline. It's believed this came from the beer they brewed. Fermented grain contained a bacteria from the soil known as Streptomyces, which makes tetracycline. Of course, this is an antibiotic to treat illness, and in ancient times it would have been key to survive potential bacterial infections. Some believe it was just a positive side effect with the antibiotic existing through accidental contamination. But medicinal chemist Mark Nelson published an article in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology. In it, he claims that because the antibiotic was also found in the Tibians called the four-year-old with traces of tetracycline, which this suggests the use of beer was to treat him. This also gives us the hypothesis that the ancient Nubians realized that beer was acting like a medicine. We do know they used beer to treat gum disease and other ailments. And these are just some ways that societies were able to thrive and build lasting communities. Too bad we can't pay student loans in beer or have beer toothpaste, but at least we still drink from the same vessel sometimes. Beer is definitely still contributing to communities with all the craft breweries popping up. And now friends and groups can meet up at a new one every week if they wanted in most regions. I mean, I've already circled 50 more breweries to visit in Minnesota, but this is also why I love to homebrew. I get to partake in the process and push the boundaries of styles to see what my taste buds will actually enjoy. No one can say the history of how we got to this point isn't fascinating, though. Join me again in the second episode as I will boil this wort, add some extract and hops, and rack the beer for the primary fermentation. And we'll also have some fun and games, of course. Until next time, salut.